today we are going to look at the anatomy of the eye as part of the ophthalmic nurses um, lecture series that we are going to be running. Okay, so what we will focus on is um, looking at the eye um, from the accessory structure point of view. So looking at some of the structures that enable the eye to do actually its job, then look at the eyeball structure itself, the um, eye proper. So from the outside layer to the middle layer to the inner layer. Then we're going to go to the interior uh, interior areas of the eye, including the chambers, um, the different type of humor that we, humors that we have, and um, the lens specifically. So pay attention as the eye is one of the um, five sensory organs that is actually mostly used. So jumping in into the um, accessory structures. So we look at the eyelid and the eyelid basically is a thin mobile fold that normally covers the, the anterior bit of the eye. It's also called the palpebra. Okay, so the function of the eyelid is quite straightforward by offering protection um, from excessive light or injury uh, when you shut down your eyelids and also maintaining lubrication uh, by lubricating the tears. So when the tears are produced from the lacrimal gland, um, then the eyelid shuts and then it distributes. It, it works actually like, um, like a wiper. So the eyelids are split basically into an upper portion and a lower portion. And normally they meet at the lateral, canthi and, and the medial one, okay? So this area that is in between the two eyelids, between the upper eyelid and the lower eyelid is called the palpebra aperture. The, so the eyelid basically is made up of uh, different layers. So we've already talked about the skin or the subcutaneous tissue. So actually this forms the most superficial bit, um, superficial bit of the eyelid. So the, the, the subcutaneous tissue um, is basically um, not made of um, a lot of fat. So it is readily um, able to distend and because of that nature, then it is able to be filled with uh, fluids and, uh, and blood. So leading to other things like edema, um, which you might actually see as periorbital edema. Then we have, we go to um, a layer of muscle called the orbicularis oculi, a very kind of, a very important kind of um, muscle, which is very important for you when you're closing the eye. So that is called the orbicularis oculi. We also have another structure there that is called the tassel plate. And this one is very important for giving it, giving the eyelid uh, its structure because it is composed of dense connective tissues. Okay, so then we have around that area, we have uh, what we call the meibomian gland. Um, others might call it also the tassel gland. So this is a very specialized sebaceous gland and it is important for secreting an oily substance uh, onto the eye. Uh, basically, and it slows evaporation of the eye, eye's tear film, okay, and preventing uh, things like um, dry eye syndrome. Then we have another um, uh, bit of muscle called the, <clears throat> the levator apparatus. More specifically, here we look at the levator palpebra uh, superioris, which is an important muscle um, uh, in enabling elevation of the eyelid or basically opening of the eyelid. As we talked about, we said. Um, the orbicularis oculi is important in closing the eyelid and levator palpebra superioris is important for elevating it or opening the eyelid. So just on top of the eyelid, we have eyelashes and uh, the lashes are accompanied by um, modified kind of sweat glands. And you can see them here, the glands of Zeiss and uh, the glands of Moll. Oh, these are very important uh, sweat glands that are found around the eyelashes. So the function basically of the eyelash is to protect the eye from direct sunlight, uh, things like dust, perspiration, and foreign uh, bodies. So um, in terms of uh, hair steel, on top, um, we also have um, the eyebrows. So technically eyebrows are uh, considered as part of the scalp. And we have, it has three parts and women might be in a very good position uh, to actually know this. Um, and some of them paint their eyebrows. So it has the head bit section, which is medially located. And then we have the body part, then there's like a small arc, and then there's uh, a tail. So the eyebrows are formed basically uh, by this uh, superficial 
they are found actually at the superficial ridge of the frontal bone. So you'll find them at uh, just at the frontal bone. And if you if you palpate the area around the eyebrows, you'll feel the frontal bone. <clears throat> so the function basically for this is to prevent sweat, water, and other debris from falling from um, up position downwards into the eye socket. Uh, also, uh, for other purposes that are not physiological, uh, the eyebrows are used for communication through facial expression. So moving along, we have the lacrimal apparatus, which is uh, composed, the apparatus is composed of several um, organs. So starting from the lacrimal gland. So this is the gland that is located in the upper outer portion of the um, orbit. And it is the one that releases um, the tears. So it's, it's, it's an exocrine gland. Uh, because it also it has the ducts. So these ducts are about um, 6 to 12 in number. And what they do is just they, they dump or they drain tears from the gland to the eyes. Okay. Then moving along, we have now once the, the tears have <clears throat> been drained to the eye, um, they, they have now to leave the eye, obviously. So that's where we have the lacrimal uh, canaliculi, which are small channels that lie in each eyelid. And basically, they drain, they drain the tears from the eye. So we have a superior duct and an inferior duct. So once they drain the, the tears, it goes to what we call the lacrimal sac. So this is the upper dilated end of the nasal lacrimal duct. And it's basically, this holds temporarily the tears before it is passed on through the nasal lacrimal duct to uh, through the nose. So the nasal lacrimal duct is now the, the, the draining bit or it is the, 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 the pipe or the duct that drains tears from the lacrimal sac into the nose, okay? So the function basically of the lacrimal apparatus, and this is what you talked about, the canaliculi, the superior one and the inferior one, they drain temporarily into the lacrimal sac, and then this one is drained by the nasal lacrimal uh, duct and then uh, released via the nose. So the whole function of the lacrimal lacrimal apparatus is to produce tears, channel it uh, through the surface of the eye. Um, and through that process, it might wash away some dust, unwanted debris, maintain moisture. Once it does that, then flushes it um, and passes it out um, as waste material. So um, we've talked about the tears uh, being produced with the lacrimal duct and all that. So let's just look at the tear film. So the tear film basically has three areas, okay? And it is a section just above or just on top of the cornea. And it, it basically maintains a, weight, a wet layer, okay? On top of the cornea and the conjunctiva. And as I said earlier, this is to prevent the dry eye syndrome. Now, when the eye is dry, remember the eyelid keeps shutting, okay? And opening. That requires some sort of lubrication. So we want the eye to be the area of the conjunctiva and uh, the area of the cornea to be a bit wet. So if it's dry, then we have a lot of friction. Then we have a, some abrasion occurring and be painful. It will end up affecting even vision. So this area is important and it has three main um, components. It has the um, lipid layer. This is, this is produced by the um, meibomian gl uh, gland and it is mostly made up of lipid, okay? So no wonder it's called that oily layer. Then at the middle, you have a watery layer, what we call aqueous um, component, which is produced uh, by the lacrimal gland. So mostly made up of the tears. Then we have the part that is in contact mostly with the cornea and the conjunctiva. It's called the mucin uh, component, uh, mostly made up of uh, mucus cells and mucus um, layer, and it is, produced by the goblet cells that are found on the conjunctiva. As we know, the goblet cells are important for production of um, mucus. So those are the three layers, the lipid, aqueous, and mucin components of the tear film. So the conjunctiva, <clears throat> so the conjunctiva basically is a semi-transparent semi uh, mucus membrane and it, which covers the sclera and it comes up until just the point of um, where we have um, the cornea starting. So there we have a lot of blood supply and that's why this area is used even for when, when you are assessing for pala in a patient, for example, who has um, anemia. 
So the mucins that are secreted by the goblet cells here on the surface of the conjunctiva are important um, for contributing to what we have in the tear film. So let's move to the muscles. Uh, so we have six main um, muscles outside the eye that govern some movement. And uh, these are important, especially for the field of vision that we have, it enables the eye to move in different direction. So we have rectus, we have two like major groups of muscles. We have rectus muscles and we have oblique muscles. So for the rectus muscles, we have a superior rectus muscle, uh, which and then we have inferior uh, rectus muscle. Then we have the lateral, lateral rectus muscle and we have the medial uh, rectus muscle. Then we have the oblique ones that enable their oblique kind of rotation. So we have a superior oblique and we have inferior oblique. So these especially help in the uh, movement of the eye in all fields of vision. The eyeball, so those, what we've just talked about is the accessory bits. So now looking at the eyeball proper or the eye itself now. So it is an organ of sight as we know, and it is normally lying protected inside the orbit of the skull. So as you can see the location, and this is important for protective purposes. Um, so on top of this, it's protected again by other things like eyelashes, eyelid, and so on and so forth. Um, on top of that, um, we also have uh, what we call the blinking reflex, <clears throat> and that is the ability for, for our eye, um, our, basically um, our eyelids to shut and open um, whenever, okay, without any kind of uh, control, okay? So if you have something like dust or an insect flying close to your eye, you will automatically close or shut your eyelids. So that is what we call a blinking reflex. And that is important uh, because we keep blinking um, to, to, to give some sort of protection to the eye itself. So the eyeball, I will look at it in, um, in an aspect of three layers. So we have an outermost layer, which is also called the fibrous layer. And it is uh, very strong, okay? Um, we basically, the outside section, we have the cornea and the sclera. So this cornea and the sclera. But now the cornea is not fibrous because if it was fibrous, then will, it will not be easily, it will not be as transparent as it is, which will affect now the passage of light. However, it is also found in the outside, um, outermost uh, region of the eye. And then we have the sclera, which is a very firm, strong kind of structure and gives the eye some kind of protection. Then we have the middle layer, which is uh, the vascular layer. Uh, this is where we have a lot of blood supply. So here we have the choroid, um, we have the ciliary body and the iris, it's a continuous kind of uh, layer. Then we have innermost layer, which is the neural layer, which has the nervous kind of uh, supply. And that is where <clears throat> we have um, the retina. Okay, so we look at individual organs in different, in this different structure. So we start with the cornea. So the cornea itself is a uh, very clear and protective outer layer. Uh, and we all actually are aware of this. And the cornea has three main layers. So if a cross section of uh, cornea is cut open, we'll actually see an epithelial, epithelium um, layer, a stroma layer, and an endothelium uh, layer. So the epithelium is the outermost layer, as you can see. And um, this one, um, it stops mostly outside the material from getting into the eye. Also, it absorbs oxygen and nutrients uh, from tears. Remember, we have just tears flowing on top. That's why we have the tear film on top of the cornea. Then we, we go to the middle layer, which is the stroma, and it is the largest, as you can see. It's the thickest. So it's the thickest layer behind the epithelium. And this is, it's, it's made up mostly of water and proteins that gives the cornea its elasticity. And that enables the cornea, to, it gives the curve shape of the cornea, which is important for refraction of light. Then we have now the innermost layer, which is the endothelium. And it's just a single layer on the back of the stroma. And the, it's normally in contact with the aqueous humor. Remember the aqueous humor is flowing here in the anterior chamber. So it is in constant with, um, 
with the aqueous uh, humor layer. So the main function of the cornea basically, <clears throat> as you all know, is first of all protection uh, from dust, germs, microorganism, and all that, but also um, against unwarranted kind of uh, light rays. So the cornea basically uh, filters some ultraviolet uh, violet, uh, light. And then the other bit, which is it allows light to pass. But more importantly also, the cornea plays a very big role, a very big role in refraction of light or basically bending of light. Then we go to the choroid. So the choroid, this is a brown, this is the brown uh, tissue which is highly vascularized, as we said. It is normally continuous with the, it is continuous with the ciliary body and the iris. So because that is where we have a lot of blood supply, then it provides nutrients and oxygen to the retina. And the choroid is basically opaque. And this is to ensure that light is not scattered um, when light bounces uh, on, on the retina. Then we have the ciliary body. Um, so this is a thick tissue that is um, found, uh, that is composed of ciliary processes. And this is a, these are the ciliary processes. So it's, it's a big muscle here. And it is also highly vascularized. As you said, it is continuous with the choroid. And it, 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 is, it, it is basically very important uh, for the attachment of the lens because that is where you have the ciliary process and the lens is attached to it. And based on the contraction or relaxation of this uh, um, ciliary processes, then we normally end up having change in the curvature of the lens and then affecting um, uh, refraction. Then we have the iris. And iris basically is uh, the colored portion of the eye that is normally positioned between the cornea and the lens. And um, as we know, this is a uh, circular and it forms an opening which we know uh, as the pupil. So the iris is made up of some muscles, okay? So we have uh, the radial muscles, which are the outer section. And then we have the circular muscles that are in the interior section of um, the iris. And based on what these uh, muscles do, then we can um, either dilate or uh, constrict the pupil. So for example, when the circular muscles when the circular muscles, these muscles, the ones that are in the interior, when they contract, you lead to the construct, uh, constriction of the pupil, which we call meiosis. And when the radial muscles contract, the radial muscles contract, we lead to dilatation of the pupil, which we call mediasis. This is important again, later on you'll see there are some drugs that we use that uh, enable mediasis or meiosis, okay? Uh, so we have then the retina. The retina is the uh, is a neural tissue, and it is found in the innermost layer. If we are classifying the the bits of the eye uh, uh, of the eye, so it's thin, semi-transparent, multi-layered sheet of neural tissue, and lines the inner section, the inner two thirds, the posterior two thirds of the of the eye. So the retina consists of certain cells that are called photoreceptors, very important because they convert light energy into nerve impulses, which can be taken up the op through the optic nerve. And then you have perception of image. So therefore the electric sig signals are passed through the optic nerve. And then we have um, the visual context. So the retina normally can be majorly, uh, grossly divided into two, uh, two major categories. So we can have um, retinal, Retinal pigmented epith epithelium, um, which is uh, just a single layer. And then we have a neural retina, which is now uh, made up of um, a, a bunch of layers. So the retinal pigmented epithelium, it's just a single uh, layer that is located in the outermost layer of the retina. And its importance is just to nourish and support the neural section. So the retinal pigmented epithelium just gives um, uh, support to the neural retina um, through nourishment. Now, when you go now to the neural retina, this is now where we have the photoreceptors, we have the bipolar cells, and we have the retinal ganglial cells. So what happens is <clears throat> the outermost 
on this neural retina is what we call the photoreceptors. And as you can see, we have different structures. Eh? This is where we have the rods and cones. Okay, and the photoreceptor cells, what they do is convert now the light photons or the light energy into electrical impulse. So remember the light hit the retina on the surface. <clears throat> so it penetrates. Now that light is converted into electrical impulses. Then it is passed through. Now the bipolar new, uh, cells, this, uh, they relay the converted impulses because they have, the impulses have been converted in the photoreceptors. Eh? And then now they are relayed from the photoreceptors to the ganglion cells. So the function of the bipolar cells is just to convey, okay, this uh, converted impulse. Now the retinal ganglion cells, these ones, they form a part of the optic nerve. So the nerves that now are passed through the bipolar neurons, they are now taken to the optic nerve because the ganglion cells form part of the optic nerve. And then now the optic nerve uh, proceeds uh, so that we end up having a visual uh, perception of the image. So the type of photoreceptors that we have uh, that are normally important for this conversion of light to electrical impulse, we have three actually types, but we'll mostly talk about these two, rods and cones. And the number of rods and cones in the human retina amount to almost between 120 million and 6 million cells respectively. So there, there are so many, there are so many. And the rods themselves, they're called rods because of the cylindrical kind of structure, as you can see. And they are much more sensitive to light. That means they only require a small amount of light for them to actually perceive whatever they need. So therefore, because of that reason, um, they are responsible for low light level uh, vision, what we call the, scoptic, the, uh, the scotopic uh, vision. Therefore, um, because of this, this is what we normally use for uh, at night, night vision, okay? So you're able to perceive shape, uh, movement, and such kind of things. In terms of distribution of where the rods are found, um, you, they are mo mostly highly, <clears throat> they are found on the outside or on the periphery of the fovea. And the fovea, as you will see, fovea is the central area of the macula where we normally have a concentration of light on the retina. So uh, this is very important. It contributes to what we call peripheral vision. So rods, the, um, the visual pigment that it, it uses is what we call rhodopsin. Okay, this is what now um, uh, is used as a visual pigment for rods. Then cones, cones, as you can see, <clears throat> they're conical in shape and are generally uh, shorter. And the cones are much less sensitive to light. Therefore, they require plenty of light. And that's, that's why we use it during the day because they require plenty of light. So they are, they are solely responsible for vision uh, in the daylight. And the cones are concentrated in the central section of uh, the rod. So therefore, uh, the part of the retina with the highest acuity of vision is this area because the fovea this is where you have the highest quality. That's where you have high acuity of vision, okay? So also, Cones are function to perceive colors uh, and they perceive the red, blue, and green as the main primary colors. So the kind of visual pigment that the cones have is what we call the opsin. Okay, um, so the chambers of the eye. And so we have basically uh, the anterior chamber, which is the area between the cornea and the iris and the posterior chamber, which is the area between the iris and the lens. So normally this area is filled by the aqueous humor. So both, both the anterior chamber and the posterior chamber are filled by the aqueous humor. And um, so we have the anterior and posterior chamber. Then um, behind, the, behind the lens up until the retina, we have a chamber that is filled with the vitreous uh, humor. Therefore that chamber is called the vitreous uh, chamber. So in terms of the humor, the humor itself, so we can have the aqueous humor or the vitreous humor. The aqueous humor is water-like uh, fluid that is normally found uh, from the, between the cornea up to the lens, okay? So remember that's, uh, so we said the anterior chamber, cornea up to the iris, posterior chamber, iris up to the cord, up to the lens. So all that section is filled with uh, aqueous humor and the aqueous humor is produced 
uh, from the ciliary body, if you remember where the cilia ciliary body is, and then it is drained uh, through the what we call the trabecular meshwork. So the aqueous humor must enter and be drained from the eye at equal rate. So the production and the drainage of the aqueous humor should be constant so that we don't have excess aqueous humor, which will lead to in, uh, increased intraocular pressure, or we have excessive drainage, which will lead to a lowered kind of pressure. So <clears throat> the function of the aqueous humor basically is to allow the cornea to expand so it can um, protect the eye because it pushes the cornea in the anterior chamber. Also preserves uh, the ocular pressure. I think I've just talked about that. And uh, the transport of nutrients. Remember, we said um, uh, the aqueous humor has some nutrients with it. So it is able to nourish uh, some parts of the lens also. The vitreous humor is a bit different. Yes, it is very clear. And it consists of sugar, salt, collagen, and hyaluronic acid together with some water. Uh, however, it has a set amount that does not change. It does not move freely. That means the content of vitreous humor does not come to the other chambers, like in the anterior chamber. No, it sticks to within that area of the vitreous chamber. So it gives the eyeball also that kind of shape and stability, okay? Because it is constant. It doesn't change, like the amount doesn't keep changing like the aqueous humor. So the function is to maintain the round shape of the eyeball and because of its clarity, okay, it's clear. And because of maintaining the eyeball structure, uh, therefore it, it's important for vision clarity and absorption of shock. If the, if the eye itself is hit or traumatized, uh, or if you hit the head, this uh, humor provides some like, it acts like a shock absorber. Then we have the lens. The lens is, I would say, one of the most important bits of the eye. So the, the lens is a clear curved disc that uh, sits just behind the iris and in front of the vitreous humor. So it is part of the eye that focuses light. So it refracts light and to the, to the area that we want now um, and to, to form a very uh, good image. So it is biconvex in nature and it has a refractive index of around 1.33. So it is attached to the ciliary process, uh, if you remember that. And um, it is non-vascular, therefore it does not have vessels. It is normally nourished by the aqueous humor. It is colorless and transparent to allow the passage of light. But it has fibers inside that enable it to bend uh, light. So the function basically one is to transmit and focus light to the retina so that we have a very clear image. And also uh, it is the main structure for accommoda accommodation. So as you see, accommodation um, occurs when we change the, the distance between where we are seeing the images, okay? So in terms of uh, layers, we have the capsule uh, layer, we have an epithelial layer and a cortex layer and nucleus. So the capsule basically is the smooth transparent basement membrane that surrounds the, the lens. So it is elastic eh? and it is composed of uh, collagen. That elasticity en enables the lens to change its uh, shape or curvature. Then we have an epithelium um, a surface which is located in the anterior portion of, of the lens that is between the, between the capsule and the lens fibers where we, most of the lens fibers are normally found within the nucleus. So that area, which might be also considered as the cortex region, um, is where we have uh, this portion. So the epithelium regulates what gets into the, the lens in terms of nutrients, ions, and all that. Then we have the nucleus itself. So the nucleus is made up of fibers, as I told you, and the fibers are very important now for the actual refraction. So, uh, in the nucleus, you have nucleated the fibers, but when you move out, as you're moving to the cortex, you'll have fibers that are not uh, nucleated. Okay, so thank you so much.